Uh, who's used APRV here? A lot, lot of you have. Okay. Good. All right. Um, so I'm just going to go through a sort of simplistic overview of APRV, uh, run through a few of the things. We've developed an algorithm that we're using here in William Harvey Hospital, which Gemma will go through at the end. Um, if you want to stop me at any point as we want go through this to ask questions, that's fine. Um, and, you know, we can have a bit of a question-answer session at the end as well. All right. Okay, so... Um, Basically, uh, the, the reason APRV is a method of ventilation that was developed quite a long time ago, actually, about sort of 20, 30 years ago. Um, but it's something that's come into vogue in the last few years. Uh, I was working in Australia uh, two, three years ago, and when I first went over there and worked at the Royal Perth, uh, they were using APRV a lot, uh, and I hadn't been using that in the UK. Uh, but then when I came back about 18 months ago, uh, everyone was using it here too. So uh, it's, it's sort of something that's taken off around the world. It's, it's used quite a lot in America as well. Um, and the, the sort of, uh, once you sort of understand the rationale behind what causes what we call ventilator associated lung injury, so you, are you all happy about the concept of <coughs> ventilator associated lung injury? The sort of concept that if you take a normal set of lungs and you ventilate them with high inflation pressures, sort of, you know, 10, 12 mils per kilo for high pressures above 30 centimetres of water and you give them high amounts of oxygen. If you take a set of lungs and do that for a few days, you, the lungs will change and will look like ARDS, all right? Uh, and that's because of ventilator-associated lung injury. So if you think about all the things that damage your lungs, all right, so high pressures, high volumes, um, uh, high amounts of oxygen and the other thing that really damages your lungs is the the, the sort of collapse and and reinflation of your alveoli okay um, so atelectotrauma we call that so if you think about all those things that that really damage your lungs on a ventilator the whole idea of APRV is it sort of does all the bits to try and avoid that all right um, and tries to avoid ventilator associated lung injury so it's, it kind of helps you think about it and APRV is obviously one of the things that we, we use, but you can do some other things. So recruitment manoeuvres, I think Gemma's going to talk to you about that today, aren't you? Or Mark is. Mark's already done it. Yeah, OK. Good, so Mark's already done recruitment manoeuvres with you. Prone positioning we've just been hearing about. And uh, I think you can definitely use APRV and prone position together. I've certainly done that successfully in a few patients. Um, I had a patient yesterday who was massively hypoxic who failed completely on APRV and their CO2 went above 20 uh, and I turned them prone and they got better. Okay, so uh, I think that they're, you know, you can use them together but they can also be uh, used differently, all right? And um, I, I was always taught when I was a fairly junior respiratory SHO that no one was allowed to die without getting a gram of methyl prednisolone. Uh, but these days, I think no one's allowed to die without having tried prone positioning on them. Okay? So, or APRV. So, one, one of the two, and if one doesn't work, try the other one. Okay? All right. Um, inhaled vasodilators, nitric oxide. I, I use nitric oxide quite extensively in the sort of 80s and 90s when I was working at places like Guy's and Bristol and so on. Um, I haven't seen much nitric oxide around these days. Is anyone using it? Yeah, I think the, the, the problem was with it, because it was a sort of byproduct of nitrous oxide production um, and it's, it's a pollutant, uh, we seem to be able to use it without it going through all the sort of normal testing and uh, uh, so on that, that most other drugs would have to go through. Uh, certainly when I was at Guy's, a whole cylinder emptied into the room and the the nurse in there didn't feel very well <laughs> for a few days. <laughs> so, so anyway, we'll forget about nitric oxide because we're not really using it much anymore. Okay. Um, so we're all happy that the, uh, the new definitions of ARDS, so they've changed from the original consensus definitions here. Yeah? Um, you don't need to write these down. Uh, uh, this, 
the, these definitions are useful for if you're putting patients into trials uh, uh, and they do obviously give you the idea about how you can label as ARDS but I don't find them that useful clinically. All right. We used to talk about mild ARDS as being acute lung injury and then severe hypoxia as being ARDS. All right. um, but uh, these days we, we, we divide it up into mild, moderate and severe depending on your PAO2 to FiO2 ratio. You're all happy about that? So that's just looking at a PaO2 on a blood gas and relating it to the amount of oxygen you're giving your patient, all right? Because obviously, just looking at PaO2 is useless unless you know what the patient's inspired oxygen is. Okay, and then obviously you need to know that this isn't cardiac pulmonary edema, all right? You're all happy about the difference between cardiac pulmonary edema, which is due to problems in pressure, yeah, from pulmonary venous congestion, and ARDS, where it's a problem with the tight junctions on the, the between the alveoli and the capillary membranes, yeah? And that it's just fluid leaking across. It's nothing to do with the pressure change, which is what cardiac pulmonary edema is due to. All right. Um, so ideally, you do some sort of echo or you need to exclude a cardiac problem for the pulmonary edema, yeah? And then obviously, it, it's usually you get sort of uh, some predisposing history and that you've got bilateral uh, opacities on your chest X-ray. All right. Okay. Oh, wrong way. Okay, so um, don't forget that the main mode of death in, uh, in ARDS, all right, is, is, uh, is obviously usually multi organ failure, but a significant number of people can die of hypoxia. Uh, and uh, obviously, sorting out the hypoxia not only prevents those deaths, but obviously can uh, lead to a lot of improvements in the multi-organ failure problem as well. Okay, so what are we talking about? And as I was saying at the start, if you think about ventilator-associated lung injury, the things that we want to avoid are we want to avoid these, you know, huge tidal volumes and sort of over-ventilated lung, all right? So, um, uh, if you think about your compliance curve, yeah, we're thinking about people at the top of their compliance curve that you don't want to be over distending them and giving them pneumothoraces and barotrauma, all right? And then the other thing you want to avoid is this de-recruited lung, yeah? So those are the people at the bottom of your compliance curve, yes, where you've got down below there uh, the, the sort of pressures in the lung and you're leading to collapse of alveoli, so that's where you're I like to think of the alveoli like a balloon, uh, and you know how well that when your balloon is completely collapsed, when you first try and blow it up, you have to have really high inflation pressures, don't you, to get it going. Once it starts to blow up, then it's easy to blow up the rest of the way, all right, because of the, the laws of Laplace, okay? So your alveoli are exactly the same. So what you want to try and do is at the end of expiration, you want to keep some air in that balloon. You don't want it to completely collapse because then you're going to need to have really high inflation pressures to reinflate it. And also we know that repeated collapse and reinflation causes inflammation within the lung and will make all your ARDS worse. All right. So what we want to try and do is ventilate the lungs in a position in between that okay and obviously different bits of the lung will be on have different compliance curves all right so we don't know exactly where we are but we want to sort of have our best guess of trying to ventilate people on that steep bit of the compliance curve where you get the biggest change in volume for the smallest change in pressure yeah you're all happy with that okay okay so this is a patient with severe ARDS and obviously what we're aiming to do is to try and get them back towards normal lung, okay, and removing these areas of consolidation, reinflating the lung. All right. Okay. So what is APRV? Obviously it's airway pressure release ventilation. And it's it's a pressure limited time cycle mode of ventilation. All right. Um, so you know, a simplistic way of thinking about it is it's CPAP with a release, all right? So we're running high airway pressures. And the way to think about it is that we, 
We usually start off with a, a pressure of about 30 centimetres of water. You can go up to about 35 centimetres of water. All right, and they've picked 30 because we know if we get above uh, 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 a plateau pressure of 30 on our, uh, you know, on our conventional ventilators, we know that we're going to start running into problems with barrow trauma. All right? But having said that, don't forget that what's important is the transpulmonary pressure. So if you've got somebody who's a really large patient, all right, if they've got a very high BMI and so on, uh, or they're a very large person, don't forget that, that the, uh, you know, having a, an inflation pressure of, of 30 on them may not be enough to move their chest wall because their chest wall compliance, etc., will be very high. All right? So having you know, a normal person who's 70 kilograms, yeah, 30 might be your limit. But if they're a big person, if they've got a high BMI, you might need 35 or even 40 centimetres to do the same thing. All right? And, and sometimes I find that I put the patient on 30 centimetres as their upper limit and you look at their tidal volume and they're getting like 75 mils uh, and then you put it up to 35 and then suddenly they're getting a tidal volume of, of 250-300, all right? So yeah, 30 is usually the limit we go for but you just need to just keep have a very eye and look at what their minute volume is and look at how much they're shifting. Okay, so when we look at our, our pressure waveform, all right, so what we do is we set, uh, we, look, we look at four parameters when we're setting up our APRV, yeah? So we, we're looking at a pressure high, which we normally set at 30 centimetres, but you, as I say, you can set it a bit higher, but I always start off with 30, all right? And then we set a pressure low, which we put as zero, all right? Uh, so normally we would always put some PEEP on our patients, all right? Because as I've said, we don't want our lungs to collapse, do we? We don't want those completely collapsed balloons. We want to hold some pressure at the end of expiration to keep our alveoli open, all right? And the reason we set the P at low is that we don't use uh, pressure to hold the lungs alveoli. So we don't use ordinary PEEP. What we use is auto PEEP because we gas trap, all right? Um, and we gas trap by having a very short expiratory time, all right? So we set our pressures on 30 and zero, all right? And then we set our time high, uh, a very high time high. We usually set about four seconds is what I start off with, all right? So you're going to have a very long inspiratory time. Why, why do we have a long inspiratory time? What's the advantage of that? I'm going to get you to do some work there. What, sorry? Yeah, that's right. So, so that's absolutely right. So what we have is that we have some alveoli are full of pus. They might be full of pulmonary edema. They might be completely collapsed. All right. Uh, they might have blood in them, whatever. So, and that's what we call sort of normal and long constant, uh, time constant alveoli, yeah? So there's some alveoli that need a long inspiratory time to get involved in respiration, yeah? To open up the alveoli, to get rid of, the fluid that's in there and to become involved in, uh, in the uh, ventilation perfusion exchange that you need within your lungs. So if you have a long inspiratory time, you can recruit those alveoli, all right? So that's why we set four seconds, all right? We then set a very short expiratory time, which I usually put on 0.7 seconds to start with, yeah? And the idea behind that is that you don't let those alveoli collapse at all. So you give a very short expiratory time and then you're back into your next inflation, all right? And so you're trapping gas in the lungs, you're getting auto peep and that's what's holding your alveoli open, all right? So don't forget, even you, because of the short expiratory time, your carbon dioxide is going to start climbing, okay? But we don't worry about that too much, all right? We're all happy about the, the uh, trials that were done by Hickling and people ages ago that we, you know, permissive hypercapnia is fine. We don't go for normal blood gases here, okay? And that the carbon dioxide should come up and help uh, compensate. And as long as you keep your pH above 7.15, 7.2, I don't care what the CO2 is, all right? We're not worried about CO2. Don't forget in those ARDS studies that were done well, 10, 12 years ago, they were given huge amounts of bicarb infusions just to help compensate. But we don't, we don't care about the CO2 as long as the pH is okay. All right. 
OK. So this is just showing you the, the uh, this is conventional ventilation, all right, where we've got peak inspiratory pressure. We've got our, our mean airway pressure, which is what improves our oxygenation, and we put PEEP on, all right? So that's conventional ventilation, all right? And obviously in APRV, what we're doing is we're, we're uh, you know, we're doing exactly the same, but we're doing it in a different way. In other words, we're doing it on timing, all right? By having this short expiratory time, we're causing PEEP to happen. So who are we thinking about doing APRV with? Well, it's, it's anybody that we're worried about oxygenation, quite honestly. Obviously, most of these patients have got ARDS, but uh, quite honestly, anybody who has got a pneumonia who we're struggling with oxygenation, uh, as far as I'm concerned, they've, they, they've drifted into what we might classify as ARDS, and I would try doing APRV, all right? So it's anybody who's got you know, oxygenation about 50, 60%, Anybody we're needing high amounts of PEEP on? Um, no, that's right, don't need that one. I'm on, I'm on the unit today, so that's why I'm interested. Um, and uh, anyone who's got you know, high PK weight pressures as well, all right? You need to consider using APRV. And so the, the group of patients we're looking at is, is the sort of moderate to severe ARDS patients, okay? You're all happy with this classification? All right, so as I said, prone positioning can help and, and I must say I'm doing less prone positioning because most of them are responding to APRV, but you can still need to use prone positioning occasionally. You'll have fun, somebody who doesn't respond or somebody who needs both. All right, so don't forget prone positioning. And obviously, you know, for appropriate patients, uh, ECMO is now becoming much more an accepted way to go and uh, you'll all have a local ECMO centre and they will come down and ECMO your patients and transfer them on ECMO. All right. And the, don't forget the other criteria about ECMO, I think we mentioned them earlier, but, but don't forget they don't like to have patients who you've been flogging away with really high inspiratory pressures and high amounts of oxygen for a few days and then refer them. They want them referred early because if they're going to be successful, they need to get them onto ECMO early before we've really damaged the lungs with our ventilation. All right, so you, you know, I'm not going to go through the whole criteria for ECMO today, you'll all have them, but it's, it's complementary. Okay, um, so are there any contraindications? Well, they're all relative contraindications, okay. Obviously, if somebody's severely asthmatic, okay, and they're really gas trapping, Having very short expiratory times, not going to be great for them. So they might not do very well on APRV. All right. Uh, anyone who's had recent lung surgery and so on, you're going to be using high inflation pressures here. So you need to think about that. Uh, and obviously, if they've got raised intracranial pressure, having very high CO2s, which goes along with this uh, mode of ventilation because of the short expiratory times, not going to be good news either. All right. But it's, you know, they're all relative really, but you need to think about those things, yeah? Okay, so what problems does it cause when we put someone on? Well, cardiovascular system is the main problem when we put someone onto APRV. If they're at all hypovolemic, you will find out when you put them on APRV and you start cranking up the pressures, okay, because their blood pressure will start plummeting. So. I usually make certain they're on some noradrenaline and I turn the noradrenaline up before I start the APRV, okay? And quite often just stick in 250 or 500 of plasma light as well because they're, they're gonna need it usually. So ideally, you've got a PICO in or some way, a Doppler or some way of, of looking at their filling pressures to make certain you've got adequate filling pressures. Obviously you can get baritromas and pneumothorax but that goes along with anybody who you're needing high inflation pressures on. Uh, you quite often get hypercapnia, but it's not usually a major problem. As I say, as long as the pH is okay, we don't get excited about that. Uh, obviously, anybody who's got head injuries, the CO2 will be up, so it might not be good. Obviously, there's a balance there because we can't oxygenate them any other way. Hypoxia is not good for the brain either, so... Uh, okay. Um, 
so I think we're all happy about being PAO2s of eight. Nobody uses any other PAO2s, do they? Or might even be. So I think everyone goes for eight now. Um, it's interesting, isn't it? Because when you look at those blood gases that were done on the top of Everest, do you know what the PAO2s were there? Yeah, four, four and a half, yeah, I think was the average, but some of them are down below four. All right, and that's, that's people who are going up and down Everest. So um, uh, you can tolerate very low PAO2s. <laughs> Did you know what their CO2 was? Oh, it was about 1.3, 1.4, so they're massively hyperventilating. All right, so that, that's what keeps you alive because the partial pressure, even though your, your PO2 is very low, because your CO2 is very low, it means the partial pressure of oxygen is a bit higher and that's so you can live. All right. Um, uh, and the other thing that keeps you going on Everest is that there's actually a pressure reversal most of the time that goes on on the top of Everest, all right, which, which means that even though you're at 29,000 feet, you're actually only at about 26,000 feet because of the pressure reversal. And so you, you can survive on that PAO2 of, of four or whatever, okay? But occasionally when the weather comes in, the pressure reversal goes and then everyone becomes hypoxic and dies, which is what, <laughs> which is what happens occasionally up there. <laughs> anyway, that's why they call it the death zone. And one in 10 people die when they get up there, so. Um, okay. Uh, so other goals of therapy, obviously we know that if you're giving above 60% oxygen you're going to be damaging the lungs, so I always try and make certain your FiO2 is below 0.6. Usually you'll find once you put someone on APRV that they're quite often down to about 30% within an hour or two. All right. um, as I say, we go for a, uh, a, a, a P plateau pressure or a, a, a P high of about 30, but occasionally you will need to run it a bit higher. So you might need to even go up to 35, or if you've got a massively, uh, somebody with a huge chest wall compliance, somebody with a big BMI or something, you might need to put 40 up, which sounds dreadful, but actually their transpulmonary pressure won't be that high. And that's what we're interested in. Um, pH is they're saying above 7.25, I'm happy with above 7.2. Um, and yeah, we run the CO2s a bit high doesn't matter. Okay. Um, so before you start, yep, you want to make certain that your circuit and your cuffs are okay on your ET tubes uh, because obviously with the higher pressures you're going to have, you know, if you've got a leak it's not going to work very well. Uh, as I said, it, the main issue is that they do become hypotensive quite rapidly so you, you need to quite often need to have them on a vasopressor and turn that up and make certain their filling is good. Uh, once they're on APRV and IDD beforehand, you need to optimise your sedation, and I'll talk a bit about, more about that in a minute. All right, because traditionally, when somebody was really hypoxic, we used to paralyse them, um, and in APRV we don't want them paralysed. All right, and the reason we don't want them paralysed is that we like to get some diaphragmatic movement, and that really helps uh, the the uh, recruitment and the oxygenation and the VP, VQ matching in our uh, bases of our lungs, so have that diaphragmatic movement. So what I usually try and do is get their respiratory rate to be about 30, and that means you have to titrate the sedation. All right, so we're going for a RAS, uh, zero to minus two, all right, um, and I try and get the, the nurses to titrate the amount of sedation and go for a respiratory rate of around 30. All right, so we avoid muscle relaxants, okay? Um, and traditionally we've always sort of used mass relaxants, particularly when we have patients on reverse ratio ventilation, which is essentially what this is, okay? It's just an extreme version of uh, reverse ratio re ventilation, yeah? We used to put people on two second inspiration and one second expiration, don't we? But now we're putting them on four second inspiration and 0.7 second expiration. Okay. Um, so the terminology's changed a bit, but basically, you, instead of saying you've got a P plateau pressure, we're saying P high, which I've said we set on 30, but you can be a bit higher to start with. Um, P low, we set on zero. As I've said, we don't use PEEP, we use auto PEEP, and that's controlled by having a very low expiratory time, very short expiratory time, but we have this very long inspiratory time to recruit all our alveoli. 
Okay. Okay. Um, I'm not certain why this slide's on there, because <laughs> uh, it's, it's SIV ventilation. <laughs> but I think they're showing you this is the time that you'd start APRV. I would have started it a bit earlier than that. But anyway, this is someone on 90% oxygenation and uh, not doing very well. So uh, I think that's why that slide's there. And um, um, this is the, the, the P low. So you put in their P, this is somebody who's now on APRV, okay? So their P low is zero and they've got this long inspiratory time. If you look at the flow rates, yeah? So on expiration, they're getting, they're expiring, expiring, and then before they've got back to baseline, you're getting your next breath in, okay? Um, and so, I, as I say, I usually set, that's, that's on 0.75, I usually start on 0.7, but it doesn't really matter. Uh, what you do is you need to eyeball your flow rates and see is that about 40% of expiration before the next breath comes in. All right. Um, and that's roughly what you need to aim for. Okay. Um, so this is somebody who's paralyzed, who's on APRV, who's completely flat. This is what you want to be seeing, okay? So you want to be seeing these little movements, which mean the patient's doing some diaphragmatic movement, all right? Because um, if you work it out, 4 plus 0.7, well, it's nearly 5, isn't it? So that's it's about 13 breaths a minute. That's what you're setting on your ventilator. And what, what I'm looking for is a respiratory rate of about 30. So I'm looking for about 20-odd spontaneous breaths, which is the diaphragm moving, all right? And that, that is what you want to see because it really helps recruitment and seems to make quite a big difference to oxygenation. Okay, so this is just showing you your expiratory flow, yep, and that you're getting your next breath in before you've completely got back to baseline, all right? Uh, and as I said, what you need to aim for is about 40%. Quite honestly, I put everyone on four seconds and 0.7, and it seems to be roughly 40%, so uh, you can play around a little bit with them if you're really uh, into it, but it seems to work just putting them on 4 and 0.7. Okay, um, so this is just uh, some images just showing you that when you do get someone who's spontaneously breathing and that diaphragm is moving, you do seem to, to help recruitment here. The green areas are, are areas that have been better uh, aerated and better oxygenated and you can see that that increases when you get that diaphragmatic movement. And it definitely seems to make quite a difference. Okay, um, so these are the, the uh, criteria for ECMO that I was talking about that I'm not going to go through. Um, but uh, the main thing to think about is that you need to think about it early. So if you've got a young person um, uh, who's got very severe ARDS. Um, you get them onto APRV, hopefully APRV is going to sort it out. But if you're struggling on APRV, obviously you've got prone ventilation. Um, but try them both if necessary, and if you're still failing, then you need to be getting on to wherever your referral center is to get them up for ECMO if they're appropriate. <laughs> okay, so, um, as I said, if you've got hypoxia, all right, so if you started on 30 and zero and you're still not, not working, like I had a patient yesterday, then you might have to go up to 35 uh, uh, or sometimes even up to 40 in appropriate patients to actually get some recruitment going, all right? Um, and so you need to look at your tidal volumes. If they're doing you know, a tidal volume of 50 mils, then they're not gonna win on that. Um, so you may have to give them acutely high pressures. You may even have to take over and sort of handbag them for a, for a minute or two. Um, or you can use some of Mark's recruitment maneuvers, um, or you can prone ventilate them, all right, which is a, is a massive way of recruiting usually. Um, interestingly, the patient that I recruited massively with prone ventilation yesterday, I'm sure it was just turning them over, just, it, it just unplugged all their alveoli that were blocked up, because then we, we hadn't been able to get anything off with suction, and turn them over, and then suddenly there was tons coming off the chest. Um, so hypercapnia, as I say, we're, we're not too worried about hypercapnia if uh, the pH is okay. Um, obviously, you can think about, uh, you've got a very short expiratory time. 
So uh, you can make the expiratory time a little bit longer or you can make your inspiratory time a little bit shorter. So you can just alter that slightly. It may be enough just to sort of hold the CO2 where it is or maybe even improve it a little bit. Um, as I said, it's usually not a problem. The, the, the patients that the hypercapnia uh, might be causing a bit more of an acidosis is patients who are usually in renal failure because their bicarbs are low, yeah, and they're in respiratory failure. So for that, I would try and get them on the filter, yeah, and give them bicarb, um, you know, or, or just give them bicarb, obviously, is the other thing you can do to try and help get the pH back up. All right, that's probably easier to do than trying to get rid of the CO2. Um, hypocapnia is rarely a problem, right? Never, I've never had a problem with hypocapnia, but... Um. Okay, um, so this is, you know, this is a compliance curve that we were talking about, yeah? So what we want to do is we want to be ventilating people on this steep bit of the curve, all right? So for small changes in pressure, small change in pressure, you're getting a large change in volume, yeah? We don't want to be up this end of the, the uh, where the balloon is completely blown up and then we're looking at getting barotrauma. And we don't want to be down here where the balloon is completely collapsed, yeah? And then we're needing high inflation pressures and we're also inflating and deflating the balloon rapidly, which leads to uh, inflammation within the lung, all right? Chemotrauma, they call it there as well. Okay. Um, this is just looking at, at trying to improve your respiratory efforts on the... So what you just need to do is just look at your uh, flow line during inspiration and just check that you're getting those little movements, yeah? Uh, and try and get your respiratory rate up to about 30. All right. Okay, so we want to look for those little movements there. Uh, good. So this one's, you know, I think that's... Is that the rate of about 35 there? Yeah. So that's, that's great there, okay? Okay, um, and that's just looking at expiration as well. Okay, um, so any problems with it? Well, the junior staff just need to uh, try and get their head around it. Um, and it's, it's obviously um, uh, a, a different way of thinking about things. So you need to think about that. If you've got junior staff on who've got no idea what APRV is overnight, you need to have some strict guidelines. But we found if we use our protocol, and once obviously uh, a lot of the nurses have got a lot of experience with it now, we don't have any major problems, do we, Mark, really, with, with the juniors? Um, and what we did here is obviously we, we've run workshops like this, um, we've developed our local guidelines and uh, everyone's used to the fact now that anyone who gets at all hypoxic or high inflation pressures, etc., we go on to APRV. Um, so we're obviously looking at it more closely. We're sharing it across the network uh, and we're using uh, one approach. Okay, any questions? <coughs>